Okay, hello and good afternoon to our seventh already Planetary Health Academy lecture on the topic of beyond exploitation, how to reimagine life and health. And we're really happy to welcome Susan Prescott and Blake Pollan today to talk with us about how we can redefine like our living together, health and our society. And we're going to start with Susan Spreskert. You're a doctor, an immunologist, and an artist, I would say as well. You can say if you see yourself as an artist, but I would say uh, seeing your slides and your presentation, you're for sure an artist, and also founding president of the In Vivo Planetary Health. So I was wondering, as I already said, you're an artist, like what brought you to this art? Mm, to combining being a doctor and being an artist and, and what kind of way it maybe even enriches your, enriches your work on planetary health. Mm. I, I think that um, narrative is so important and um, creativity is so important. And I think that we have tended to, to separate our creative selves, our heart, if you like, with the intellectual aspects of this. And I think if we're really going to communicate big issues like this, we really have to do it um, in a, a very complete way. Uh, and that will come through, I think, in, in my slides. So I also think it's really important to do what you love and love what you do. Uh, and uh, I feel that um, I, I, I really love doing my art and then combining it with my science. So for me, um, it is very fulfilling to have this approach and I also know that when especially when you're talking to the public and, and um, uh, people beyond the walls of academia and even academics it's really wonderful to to actually do this in, in a way that makes people think more deeply art is a real reflection um, of our world uh, and I think what people see in art is really a reflection or their reaction is really um, says more about how they're feeling than it does necessarily about the artist so <laughs> but thank yeah, you very much for this opportunity I should have said at the beginning <laughs> we're really happy no yeah, don't worry we're really happy that you're joining us today and I actually think that when we see your presentation now the image they're like really underlining your message and they're really also giving me as a viewer a more like I don't know kind of deeper understanding and a greater vision or the possibility to really see and kind of feel yeah. in a way what you mean well so I think inspiration and hope are so important uh, and I think that we can often feel uh, quite a lot of despair when we look at the challenges around us but we also have to remember that we are incredibly resilient that the greatest place that we can make change is in our own hearts and what we do um, so I, I think that there has to be really a critical part of a critical dimension of change okay yeah exactly so I would say to all our uh, people from the audience let let yourself inspire no let susan inspire you this way and let you inspire you <laughs> and, and then yeah exactly yeah let you yourself <laughs> inspire you by taking a pencil whatever a pen um a crayon and just drawing something so yeah yeah we're really excited about your talk thank you Hi everyone, it's wonderful to be sharing with you today uh, and I want to begin by thanking the organisers for this uh, wonderful opportunity. I'm going to be talking about symbiosis on all scales from personal to planetary ecology. I am an immunologist and a paediatrician, but today I'm going to be particularly talking to you in my capacity as the president of In Vivo Planetary Health. The goal of this talk is really to frame human health uh, and immune resilience in particular in the wider context of all of the interconnected grand challenges that we're facing today. In many ways, declining immune health reflects ecosystems disruption on all scales and so restoring health will depend on an ecological perspective. Immune health is fundamental for all 
aspects of health and development for not just our resilience to infection, but in the reduced propensity for inflammation and chronic diseases. So we can see that our vulnerability at the moment to many of these conditions is really a measure of declining lifestyle and environmental health. But my talk is really also going to extend to the much bigger uh, picture the need for imaginative solutions that build on the very best of human nature, the deeper values that unite, empower and refocus our priorities uh, as individuals, but also uh, as societies towards much healthier futures. The Anthropocene has been an era of profound uh, ecological imbalance affecting health on all scales and humanity has really affected planetary systems to such an extent that our own well-being is now under threat. Human health cannot be separated from the health of our environment and that extends from our physical, emotional, social environments to our economic, political and even spiritual ecology. Even before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we were seeing a global NCD crisis, and that was inextricably linked to the erosion of all of these interdependent ecosystems. We are seeing progressively younger phenotypes of all of these non-communicable diseases. We're seeing a shorter life expectancy in the current generation compared to their parents, simply because of obesity, particularly in disadvantaged populations. As I mentioned, I'm a, a paediatrician and an allergist, and among all NCDs, allergy is the most striking measure of early environmental impact because we see these conditions within weeks of birth. In countries like Australia, allergy is now affecting one in four infants, uh, and in preschool children, we have seen a 500% increase in life-threatening uh, allergic uh, reactions. So infant allergy is really a sentinel measure of the impact of the early environment on our immune health and has much wider implications for many other chronic inflammatory diseases. It's a canary in the coal mine. But that canary perished many years ago, uh, in a sense, and we have really been very slow to make those connections. And our birds are literally dying. In the much wider sense, we can see there has been an overlooked biodiversity crisis in the last 50 years. There have been massive declines in birth species as a really important indicator of ecosystems health on a much larger scale. There have been parallel collapses of insect species, uh, and this is vitally important for our entire global food web. So we're seeing that the health of every ecosystem depends on the health of its smallest parts. And the best example are microorganisms, which are critical to both large scale systems like climate biology, right through to the health of every individual organism. However, we have seen the effects of urbanization on large scale biodiversity loss, and this is echoed through right down to the microecological scale with impacts on our personal and on environmental microbial systems, ranging from soil systems right down to what's happening in our gut microbiomes. Allergy was one of the first fields to link biodiversity loss to human health, particularly the loss of microbial uh, biodiversity, which is so essential to human uh, immune health and development. But the significance of this observation was really not fully appreciated at the time. Now, of course, we're seeing that dysbiotic drift is associated with almost all non-communicable diseases. Uh, we are seeing that there is evidence of ecological extinction or disappearing microbes in many Western populations. And this is directly linked to physical and mental well-being. So we really can see a direct line between life in distress or dysbiosis at the cellular scale and life in distress at the planetary scale. And the drivers of inflammation and dysbiosis are echoed through on every level. So the ecology of the early environment is particularly important in determining lifelong health, ranging from microbial diversity to nutrition, nature and social interactions. 
immune health is really core in this equation. It is central to all aspects of physical and mental development. It determines both our acute and our chronic vulnerabilities. And we can see that early life experience really primes for our propensity to low grade inflammation and our risk for many NCDs much later in life. Perhaps one of our greatest battles in the 20th century has been our war on microbes. It has taken us decades to learn that this is not the solution and is actually implicated in the epidemic of so many early onset non-communicable diseases. And now in the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're seeing new concerns about the increasing use of detergents, disinfectants, antibiotics, particularly during critical early periods of development. We're seeing an extinction of experience that really is a result of many things, including changes in human behaviour with modernity. We're seeing progressively more time indoors, less contact with biodiverse and natural environments. So this is another major factor in our reduced early life experience. Uh, and this is implicated in the increasing propensity for in inflammation and immune dysregulation. Again, greater implications in the COVID era. The technology culture, uh, while very important uh, and crucial to situations like this, it does have implications. The digital displacement of in-person experiences, natural environments and social uh, interactions are all having an impact on our physical and mental health. And this is of growing concern. We see that screen time promotes many pro-inflammatory behaviours for non-communicable disease risk, ranging from stress, our eating behaviour and choices, nature deficit, as I mentioned, inactivity, and of course, uh, sleep disturbance as well. Extinction of experience is multidimensional. And here in this uh, depiction of the total exposome, you can see that traditionally we tend to focus more on the toxic exposures uh, in adversity, uh, the increasing presence of detrimental exposures. And of course, this is very important, but we tend to neglect the other side of the equation, the increasing absence of protective lifestyle factors and buffering factors ranging from uh, nature, exposure, traditional foods, physicality, community, positive emotions, uh, mindfulness and spirituality. Again, the things that tend to be neglected in this conversation. So this is why ecological solutions are required to improve our long-term resilience. These must also focus on restoring the positive influence as well as reducing adversity. And a good example of these is the nature exposure, nature connectedness as a basic uh, psychological need. Promoting nature connection has so many health benefits ranging from improved dietary habits, exercise, sleep, performance, social, emotional assets, as well as the effects on our skin and our gut microbiome. And importantly, a better connection to nature means that children uh, as adults will have greater environmental concern and are much more likely to protect our environments. So this really underscores the multifaceted benefits of relatively simple low cost approaches, the relevance of taking an ecological approaches to healthcare. We can also see that many of these uh, positive assets um, really also promote our immune resilience, both the short term protection from infection as well as our long term health protection, uh, buffering against inflammation, disease and premature ageing. The omics revolution has really been very important for providing biological measures of the total exposome. It's also been uh, important in framing the Anthropocene associated diseases in this wider context, drawing direct lines between what's going on on the micro scale and uh, planetary systems. This is all calling for a far greater awareness of these many bi-directional relationships. It's also calling for a greater awareness of our connectivity as a vital part of the solutions. Connections to people, our connections to places, community, all of these things inspire health at all levels.
When we look at the grand challenges of the Anthropocene, so many are of our own making. They ultimately stem from human attitudes to each other and to our environment. The solutions must therefore also be of our making, recognising the interdependence of these challenges and that connectivity is vital to the solutions. And concepts like planetary health really help us recognise these interwoven complexities. But these still rarely confront the underlying value systems that created so many of these interconnected problems in the first place place or the attitudes that perpetuate them. Still, the agenda is often dominated by the very worst of human nature, while the best is neglected and devalued. And of course, I'm talking about the importance of empathy, kindness, hope, love, creativity, and mutual respect, the deeper values that unite, empower, and refocus priorities of individuals and of groups. In doing so, we have failed to recognise that this is part of the problem and arguably these are also our greatest assets in overcoming these challenges. So we need to normalise more mutualistic creative approaches, including the perspectives of traditional cultures, to positively influence normative value systems. The dysbiotic drift that we've seen in recent decades includes a normative shift towards narcissism and self-interest with an increasingly narrow focus on economic and financial value, which has really radicalised empathy, kindness and compassion. We see broken systems are damaging to health, the social fabric and natural environments. And this broken spirit is manifest in increasingly polarised political agendas. This polarisation is manufactured by vested interests on all sides. We're seeing an infodemic of propaganda and misinformation, which is manipulating perceptions. A creed of power and greed have dominated the global agenda, concentrated in the hands of a few. In any ecosystem, this is unsustainable with a pressing need for balance. So it is vital that we redefine progress and growth in more meaningful ways and recognise that not all innovation is improvement and there must be a greater value placed on deeper wisdom. Of course, technology is a vital part of the solutions, but only if we apply much more mutualistic value systems as a compass. And to quote Renee de Boz, lest we end up with a jumble of technologies and counter technologies that smother body and soul. So the planetary health agenda should equally consider our social and spiritual ecology as it does our natural uh, ecology. We must address the broken spirit as well as broken systems. Individuals have much more power than we realise, but there has been every effort to maintain that status quo, distracting and reinforcing false and polarising narratives, promoting powerlessness and hopelessness. So it really is time to raise awareness of the algorithms behind the curtain. Awareness changes everything and we can lift the curtain. Awareness in many ways is the first step to transformation as both individuals and as societies. It allows us to see the challenges and the possibilities in much more meaningful ways. And mindful awareness includes awareness of our own attitudes to ourselves, to others and to all things. This really is part of expanding from simply an intellectual approach to a true experience of connectivity through awe and wonder and gratitude and hope. It's about unleashing our creative power to imagine a better future, recognising that our thoughts and shared imaginings are much more powerful than we realise. So in the coming years, we at Invivo, through our networks, really seek to place a greater value on creativity, imagination and self-development in solving challenges at all scale, to value the positive assets in health and resilience on all scales, uh, including the awe, the wonder, the joy, the love and compassion, recognising that these also mediate social responsibility 
and environmental concern. It's time, in other words, to employ all of our resources, to use our hearts as well as our minds. And this really should not be such a radical concept. But they're often the things that are dismissed as fuzzy uh, and fluffy and unscientific. This emphasises the importance of cultural expression, artistic creations and narratives in linking the health of people, place and planet. It really encourages everybody to work in the space between our silos of expertise as we harness the spirit of connectivity, community, collaboration, purpose uh, and uh, belonging. So this is really something that everyone can be part of. Improving planetary health should not be by invitation only. And all citizens of the world have the capacity for imagination, kindness, joy, so all are qualified uh, to join. We know that changing mindsets can change everything. It's the real root of everything we do as individuals and societies. It's the most powerful thing we can change as individuals. The events of 2020 have been a profound tipping point in so many ways. The economic fallout alone means that we can't simply return to where we were. This is a real opportunity to reassess our collective values, priorities, our sense of self and community uh, in hopefully a gateway to a more resilient future. It has been a time of unprecedented and sudden change. It has shown us more than ever that planetary health is very personal. It has also shown us that we can rapidly change priorities and behaviours. It's been a wake-up call on so many levels to so many dysbiotic systems and a real opportunity to shift our trajectory towards a much more sustainable and resilient future. Restoring resilience after a pandemic is not simply about restoring the status quo. It must be about restoring hope and purpose, more vibrant communities, an opportunity for equity and social and environmental justice for much more sustainable, healthier economies. And like all natural systems, we need to find a new and different stable state. In so many ways, the impact of COVID-19 has been so great because our systems have been so unhealthy. And that applies at the level of personal immunity right through to planetary immunity. For all of us, this is a time to reassess our personal priorities, an opportunity to think about how we want to live on the other side. The century old words of Japanese poet Masahide remind us of how traumatic events can provide new opportunities and new awareness that lead to wisdom and growth. With my barn burned down, nothing obstructs my view of the moon overhead. And this is at the heart of contemporary post-traumatic growth research, which extends beyond recovering to a previous state or situation, but one of far greater growth. We know that acute events can catalyze and accelerate positive change through more expanded awareness, purpose and meaning for much greater appreciation of life. And certainly 2020 has been a year of mass trauma. It has unmasked many chronic problems and breaking that status quo may also provide opportunities to accelerate change. So what applies to personal growth may apply equally at the collective scales. And it may be our hope that this will lead to new awareness for new growth at all scales that what may have seemed impossible before has now become essential. The aftermath of this mass trauma, in other words, provides opportunities for large-scale post-traumatic growth, an opportunity to reappraise our values, place higher values on environmental and social concern, and greater awareness for new possibilities and shared wisdom. So certainly we need to consider what we do as individuals to strive to be part of the solution through our personal commitment to shaping change in all aspects of our daily life. 
but we can also contribute to a greater change narrative through our connectivity, our shared purpose, which can magnify change. Hope, of course, is generated through action, and we may hope that this leads to a pandemic of possibility. We know that when we begin any journey, that even small changes can signal really important long-term shifts in where we end up in our health behaviours and the wider values. So this is really important as we think about the health of our future trajectory. We should not underestimate the ripple effects of small changes. We've just seen the impact this past year. So now it is time to initiate a contagion of much more positive change. Imagining the future is the very first step to getting there. And we might all begin by asking ourselves what kind of world we want to live in. And that is very much the agenda of In Vivo and our activities around Project Earthrise. And we invite all of you to join uh, our virtual conferences. Uh, we have wonderful materials that you can access and I invite everyone to join us. We have ongoing live campfires and everyone is welcome. It's also an opportunity for uh, me to invite you to uh, contribute to our journal challenges. Uh, we invite submissions across a broad range of topics. Uh, so please uh, check out our website uh, and uh, contact me. I'm the editor in chief if you need any more information about this. Uh, finally, uh, if you want to know more about In Vivo and our values, please uh, visit uh, the uh, Challenges Journal for the Canmore Declaration, which articulates many of these things and more. And finally, uh, as I conclude, I just want to share with you a brief 90-second uh, video that captures uh, so many of these things. And I once again want to thank you all for this amazing opportunity to share with you today. Thank you so much, Susan, for this thought-provoking input, uh, making the connections between personal and planetary health. And thank you so much for the beautiful slides. They were much admired by the participants and we received so much praise in the chat. We will uh, discuss with Susan later on. Uh, before that, we will go on to our next speaker. And we already heard from Susan uh, about the power of community and connectivity. And this is something our second speaker will uh, talk more about. I'm happy to introduce Blake Poland. Blake Poland is a professor in the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, where he's also the director of the collaborative graduation, graduate specialization in community development and a senior fellow with the Center for Critical Qualitative Health Research. His work focuses on community resilience, community development as an arena for, of practice for health and social care professionals, 
sustainability transitions and the role of civil society and social movements as agents of social change. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Sophie, for that lovely introduction. And uh, it's such a, a treat to be with you all and to follow Susan, who's uh, important, inspiring and beautiful message and uh, is just uh, such an honor to follow um, uh, what we just experienced together. And uh, a warm hello to all of you who I can't see <laughs> who are on uh, this call. And uh, thank you to Sylvia and Martin and other organizers for this opportunity to share um, some thoughts about how we rewire <laughs> ourselves for a different kind of planetary health. So I'm going to share my screen. And put this in slideshow mode. And um, so what I'd like to do today is um, in in the theme of beyond exploitation and reimagining life and health offer four building blocks for a different way forward than we're usually offered as um, pathways to uh, a deeper transformative action. And I want to start by uh, a land acknowledgement um, and I'll do that from where I am <laughs> in the University of Toronto. Um, and the land that we're on for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And today it continues to be the meeting place for many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, including the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Métis and Inuit peoples and also increasingly the host to Indigenous peoples from all over the world. And we're really grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and benefit from it in many ways. And at the same time, find it important to recognize that colonization is the primary reason for many of the social and economic challenges facing Indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world. And the doctrine of discovery and terra nullis racist ideologies that were used to justify colonization by European settlers of the land we currently call Canada and our government's policies and practices have deliberately marginalized Indigenous peoples to the benefit of non-Indigenous settlers. So I recognize also as a settler the enormous privilege that I um, have gained as a result of that and uh, an enduring um, commitment to reconciliation and uh, Indigenous sovereignty. I want to also give thanks for everything that has enabled this moment of us together. Um, the ab abundant generosity of Mother Earth that makes everything possible from the internet to the chair I'm sitting on to the breakfast I had this morning um, in a in a dominant um, narrative of scarcity and competition, we often overlook that abundance that's all around us. And at the same time, we have um, global uh, systems and processes that have systematically sought to harness that abundance and channel it into um, a process of uh, wealth concentration that um, relies on exploitation of natural and human resources and uh, the freedom, quote unquote, to pollute and destroy um, with abandon and um, uh, harm the global commons. And uh, we find now a, a, a convergence of challenges of climate change, ecological degradation, resource depletion, energy insecurity, and widening socioeconomic disparities, many of which were so um, beautifully illustrated in uh, Susan's talk. I, I particularly like this cartoon because I, it's from a, a Toronto cartoonist, Tony Biddle. I use it in almost all of my talks now because I find that it's so, um, succinctly summarizes the way we've um, seemingly agreed to organize human affairs on the planet at this time. And we see the consequences of that. I probably don't need to remind you since you're all in a planetary health alliance um, and have probably studied these in great detail, but we see uh, a, a sharp acceleration in human impact on, on 
multiple um, cascading environments. And, and um, for those who have started to think about what this might mean in the coming future, we actually have uh, plausible dates for cascading socioeconomic and ecological systems collapse somewhere between 2025 and 2045, which is well within the lifespan of all of us watching here, I would wager. And so this can be pretty sobering and um, most of our responses so far have not been up to the task or the urgency, the scale of change required. And partly because we in public health and in other spheres remain firmly in the grasp of risk management as a default modality for um, addressing some of the sequelae of the systems that we keep investing in. Um, unfortunately, these are proving increasingly ineffective and even counterproductive, um, partly because risk management is really about maintaining the status quo. For example, we tend to frame resilience in terms of bouncing back from adversity or return to normal, even though we recognize the dysfunctionality of the status quo in both social and ecological terms. And we're finding that control is increasingly elusive. We live in an, an interconnected and complex world. And we find ourselves locked into a kind of path dependency where we keep investing in systems that are creating more and more problems. And we have to invest more and more to prop up the status quo. And we find more and more side effects of those that require more of our attention. So clearly a deeper paradigm shift is required. And what I'd like to do here is suggest that there are four promising directions from an emerging but also established and often ignored landscape of possibility. And I'm going to go into each of these um, in turn. The first is really to recognize that um, a lot of change happens and starts from the margins and that social movements have been active in this space for decades. Um, Paul Hawken, who um, penned the book that's in the middle um, illustration there, Blessed Unrest, estimated uh, 10 years ago that there were at least uh, 350,000 move, such movements around the world. Some are small and they're unique to a, a particular community and others like 350.org are, are really global. And I've just put a few examples there um, of the, the, the tens and hundreds of thousands of movements that are mobilizing to um, make a deeper transition to a more socially just and ecologically sustainable future. The Transition Town Movement is just one such example, and I think you have that um, quite extensively in Germany as well. We have it in Canada. We have over 100 uh, cities and communities in Canada participating in some way in the transition movement, which is a citizen-led initiative that started in the UK in 2006 and has now spread to at least 40 countries around the world. Its, its core is really about building community resilience in the face of emerging threats, emphasizing connectedness, relocalizing production and reducing dependence on fossil fuels. And one of their bylines that I particularly enjoy that I'll circle back to later in this talk is the notion that as, as Rob Hopkins, the originator of the movement um, puts it, if it isn't fun, it isn't sustainable, which I, I like, it's like a double entendre on the word sustainable, right? That the movement itself isn't sustainable if we don't find a way to nourish ourselves in that work, but it's also not um, sustainable ecologically either. When we um, researched the emergence of the transition movement in Canada, we found so many examples of proactive work happening. These are not things that typically make the evening news, uh, but they are such inspiring um, inventions, if you will, of um, socially and ecologically oriented practices um, that creating the kind of future we want to have collectively. And much of this work is really about moving from uh, resilience just as a capacity to bounce back from adversity to learning how to embrace change and bounce forward into new ways of thinking and doing. My second um, offering here in terms of um, building blocks for 
uh, a very different future is really to engage in some deep decolonizing work. And I mean that uh, word, we, we see it um, referenced in many ways in the context of indigenous peoples and the need to decolonize universities and spaces and systems and structures. And I think that's hugely important and I don't wanna distract from that at all. But I think there's a whole other layer um, in which we need to acknowledge that we're all socialized into a worldview that we take for granted and that supports the status quo, that naturalizes in inequality and competition, domination, and a scarcity mentality. And that is encoded in a series of stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and where we're headed and what impact is seen and, and of what is seen as possible and what we invest in. And, and three of those stories illustrated on the right there are a kind of greening business as usual or what is sometimes referred to as sustainable development or more broadly our sense that our salvation will come through technological solutions to some of our deepest challenges. Um, that is the dominant uh, narrative that we see in the mainstream media. There is a countervailing one of societal collapse and we see the growth of survivalist movements and uh, other initiatives. Um, there was a quite a remarkable series of articles in the New Yorker a couple of years ago about how Silicon Valley is investing in nuclear bunkers and um, land in New Zealand and elsewhere to ride out the collapse. So this is not just a fringe uh, initiative. Now some of the wealthiest and most powerful people in our societies are, um, are also um, in that, um, finding themselves in that narrative. And there is a third one, which is really about conscious evolution, that um, we're being called to step up into our more powerful selves, into our capacity to co-create a very different future than the one that we seem to have queued up for ourselves at the moment. And that it is precisely in these moments of deep challenge that we reach inside and discover the depths of what we're capable of individually and collectively. And that was so beautifully illustrated in, in Susan's talk. And these stories count, but whose stories count and who gets to tell them and who's listening and how they're heard are still enduring questions. And um, many of the issues around which of these stories are dominant and how they get told are so important, not only for who gets left out and who gets re-traumatized and marginalized, but also where um, we invest as a society, what choices our governments make. And I want to also say that even though the dominant narrative is very much about separation and disconnection, as Charles Eisenstein and others would argue is really the core of our challenge here, but from an historical perspective, really only people who can afford to meet all their needs in the marketplace can afford to have no relationships. For everyone else, and indeed throughout history, community and relationships based on reciprocity are what has enabled survival. And so I think that's a useful reminder because we tend to think that um, we have to work hard at changing the narrative. Um, but we find that actually the narrative we're, we're in now is an expression of privilege and uh, dislocation simultaneously. When we think about this decolonizing work that we're invited into, um, I want to emphasize that we're, we have the opportunity to draw inspiration from many non-dominant knowledge traditions from critical and progressive traditions at the margins in the global north I recognize there's a little problem here around whether we're talking about the West or the East, uh, the global North and the global South. The nomenclature is not perfect, but um, if we think of neo-European traditions at the margins like degrowth, political ecology, critical race theory, eco-feminism, earth traditions uh, like deep ecology, neo-paganism, animism, druidry, and indigenous ways of knowing that emphasize connection to the land and to our ancestors, to all our relations, the sacredness of all life, and global south epistemologies like Buen Vivir, Friarian critical pedagogy, liberation theology, notions of collective health from Brazil and elsewhere. We, we see that in fact we have a lot of um, possibilities for where we draw inspiration in thinking about decolonizing ourselves from the dominant western paradigm that has governed 
our social and political lives in the last couple of decades. And at the same time, I want to acknowledge the dangers of cultural appropriation and the need for very real reconciliation and repatriation, indigenous people's sovereignty and resolution of unresolved land claims, honoring of treaties and the meaningful uh, and meaningful and genuine allyship. And these are all super important and beyond the scope of my talk today to get into. Um, But I think all of this, when we do this decolonizing work, invites us to rethink the very nature of the problems we're facing. And I want to pose this question to you that what if the sustainability crisis is not a technical problem or even a social and political problem, but actually at its root, a relationship problem that we've fallen out of right relationship with ourselves, with each other, with the more than human world. And that multi-layered nature of disconnection that Susan so beautifully illustrated in her um, talk really is at, at part of what is driving this further disconnection and further um, exploitation and domination. And also is coloring the way we think about social change itself. And I wanna contrast here the columns on the left and the right as different perspectives for thinking about change itself. Because so much of what we're spoon fed in Western society is a series of assumptions and understandings about change work that is, seems almost designed to disempower us. So on the left here, you'll find a lot of this very familiar that we're told that we need to act to reduce harm, that humanity is a blight on the planet and that being green is all about what we need to give up and do without, that social change is hard work and many people burn out trying to make it happen, that so few people know what's going on, that the amount of work to be done to educate and raise awareness is overwhelming, that change is sufficiently linear and predictable that you could at least compare the amount of energy you put into social change work with what you get out and decide on that basis whether it's worth it. And you're unlikely to act if it seems like it won't make a difference based on that calculus. So then we talk about how hope is somehow a prerequisite for action. If you don't have hope, why would you do anything? But I'd like to suggest um, that um, there are other ways of thinking about social change. That instead of thinking about humanity as a blight on the planet, we can think about what is our role, not just in reducing harm, but actually producing mutual benefit and regenerative sustainability and engaging in reciprocity. And there's some beautiful work. I've just been listening to um, a delightful book read by the author, an audiobook version of her original print book um, called Braiding Sweetgrass, in which she talks about how indigenous science and modern science has come to appreciate that actually, for example, in the case of sweetgrass, um, a symbiotic relationship with humans where humans cultivate with care sweetgrass actually encourages our gro its growth. And when um, humans are not involved, sweetgrass does not grow as well. And we can see actually that uh, symbiosis if we take a post-humanist approach in all kinds of areas in terms of our relationships with the plant world. So we see that in fact, humans have a vital and important role to play in creating more thriving, flourishing and beautiful environments. And that the, the crises that we're facing are an opportunity to create the kind of society we always wanted. We were sold this bill of good of the American dream and we found that it produced actually record levels of Prozac use. So we have an opportunity now to rethink the entire enterprise. We also have the opportunity to, to reframe from social change as hard work to in fact, doing what you love and inviting others to join. This notion of if it's not fun, it's not sustainable. And that a few trigger events can spark a rapid change in awareness and willingness to act. And we've seen that as Susan pointed out with COVID, things like guaranteed annual income that were seen as almost laughable before the pandemic are not, have become a matter of policy during the pandemic and sparked very real conversations about what of that needs to endure after we, as we come out of the pandemic. 
And we recognize that social change is almost always nonlinear and unpredictable, that there are social tipping points just as surely as there are climactic tipping points, and they can come with surprising ease and quickness. And that we, what we do and how we are in the world is an expression of an alignment with what we value. So rather than saying, oh, I can't be bothered to act unless I'm really gonna see the results of that kind of calculus, we actually realize that our action in the world is an expression of who we are. And we do it without having to micromanage all of the ripple effects of how that plays out in the world. And as Bill McKibben, the originator of 350.org has pointed out, Hope is generated through action rather than as a prerequisite for action. So I think as we decolonize ourselves from the dominant paradigm, we also are invited into shifting our understanding of how change happens. A third building block that I'd like to offer is the opportunity to embrace animism and a relational worldview. That worldviews and ways of being that are common amongst Indigenous peoples, as well as European traditions of various kinds and Shinto traditions in Japan and elsewhere, see life as animate, sentiment, and possessing agency and spirit. And that a world that is truly alive, that speaks to us, that works together to co-create reality, is actually quite a different world from the one that modern Western culture sees as a world of things or resources at our disposal with humans at the pinnacle of evolution. So what if we not only learned about nature or in nature, but also from nature? And this whole field of biomimicry is actually showing us the incredible wisdom and um, fertility and fecundity of nature and the possibilities for reimagining how we do things. And I think it invites us to ask ourselves what kind of deep listening to ourselves, to each other and to the land engenders the transformative change that we're all secretly or not so secretly yearning for, even as we're also paradoxically at the same time a little afraid, right? We, we're, we have this kind of ambivalent relationship to transformative change. And what is the quality of being from which we source our knowing and doing? I think that's really key because often we get afraid of what we see coming and the stories we tell ourselves about uh, catastrophic climate change, et cetera. And we flail around in panic and anger and blaming others and pointing fingers. And are we really creating the world that we want in that process? Or do we need to anchor into something deeper and act from that space? And some of this, um, I'm not gonna get into this in too much detail because I think I'm taking a little longer than I had anticipated, but we had a project a, a year or two ago that was just published um, last year um, on many lenses for planetary health where we tried to um, reimagine citizen engagement processes for sustainable futures, um, drawing on indigenous ways of knowing. And we used a talking circle methodology and um, really found that we were able to significantly shift the focus of discussion in these processes by bringing more um, non-dominant ways of thinking and uh, knowing into um, rather otherwise conventional processes of citizen engagement and consultation. So my final um, and fourth uh, point is to really uh, think about what seeds are we watering and this follows um, pretty closely on Susan's invitation to think about what kind of world we want. That I think we need to conjoin a clear eyed realism about our current state of affairs with a vision of what, as Michael, uh, as um, uh, Charles Eisenstein puts it, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. That energy flows where attention goes and that we want to water the seeds of our dreams. And I think Martin Luther King illustrated this so brilliantly in his classic speech, I have a dream. And I think the left and other movements have forgotten this and it's all about what we have to give up and the, the frightening state of affairs. And we've forgotten that we're, um, we're born to dream and that uh, dreams can motivate and move mountains. And we, in fact, also have many traditions we can build on here. Everything from positive deviance, appreciative inquiry, asset-based community development, post-traumatic growth, as Susan um, 
pointed out in her talk, community resilience, morphic resonance, quantum social theory, um, uh, Marie Brown's um, pleasure activism, Peggy Holman's work on engaging on emergence. I've put little um, il illustrations of some of those books here, but there are so many parallel and emerging traditions and movements now that are building on this fundamental understanding that the more we can articulate what we want and not just what we don't want, the more we can propel ourselves into um, a future that um, is collectively more socially just and um, ecologically sustainable and more in line with a notion of sacred living and sacred reciprocity. And so that the, the work itself brings us joy instead of being overwhelmed and uh, disconnection and fear. So my closing invitation is to discover your sweet spot if you haven't already. Um, that's at the nexus of what you love, what you're good at and what serves the world. And we all have that. We're here, I believe, for a reason um, to contribute to this um, momentous sustainability transition and shift that uh, is already well underway and that really is the defining feature of um, this and the next generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blake, for your great talk. And the two of you, they had like, of course, obviously similarities that we need to find different ways and new ways of thinking to kind of solve the problems we created with our old way of thinking, I would say, either by becoming more creative and joining, for example, art and our work, like being in pediatrics or immunology. And also by, as you said, like, looking at the non-dominant way of thinking, which I very much liked. I have a, like a positive question for you as we want to have a positive look on this topic as well, which is, uh, wait a second, yeah. What gives you hope that we are on the right track towards this kind of change to a healthier and more sustainable society? So what in the recent months, weeks, or in the last year, showed you that, yes, we're on a good way. If I, I'll, I can answer first, and then maybe we yeah. can ask Susan the same question, because I'm sure she has lots of to contribute to that also. My, I, I think we see so many things going on now. Um, I, in one of my slides, listed just a handful of the many social movements that are so active in these spaces right now. Fridays for a Future, the Tiny House Warriors, uh, there's so much going on and you know they they don't tend to make the evening news but it's like a groundswell of action for imagining a better world not just imagining but also making it real in in uh communities in people's everyday lives in everything from um community garden gardens and community orchards through to um new uh, declarations and eco-village experiments and all kinds of things. A lot of this is more at the grassroots level because we find so much intransigence and lack of movement and breakthrough at the global and international kind of formal systems level. But many of these movements are also international and global in scope as well. So for all of the challenges of the internet and, um, you know, the bifurcated kind of social spaces that it can contribute to. It's also um, really helped um, unify many of these movements and initiatives around the world. And so I, I think the, the interesting thing about this, of course, is that um, you see what, to some extent, what your, the, what color glasses you put on <laughs> in this, that um, people who are waiting for um, immutable proof of, um, in order to be hopeful, I think can find lots of reasons not to be. Um, but I, I take a somewhat different view that I think the polarization that we're experiencing right now in so many ways is a natural part of 
the process of deep transformative social change that those who are anchored more in the dominant paradigm are not going to go easily. They're going to go kicking and screaming and they're going to look for familiar, you know, uh, certainties, whether that's in um, the religious right or in other forms. And I think to some extent the polarization is just a sign of a cracking apart of the old systems. And I, I really struggled with this for a while because I, I had my own dark night of the soil, soul <laughs> exploring all of these issues and feeling like we were really not on a happy trajectory and really being concerned about the polarization that I was seeing. And then it, it kind of dawned on me that actually the dominant paradigm is just not going to go necessarily silently off into the night. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's as I forget if it was Marianne Williamson or someone else who said, you know, the, the cracks are what the lets the light in. So we have so much innovation at the niche, you know, what, what sustainability transition people call niche innovation at the margins. Uh, but for that to scale up into what they refer to as regime change, uh, we need, um, we need destabilization of various forms, even no matter how deeply uncomfortable that is for many of us. And of course, you know, I want to emphasize that that discomfort is also a marker of privilege for those of us who haven't already been chronically destabilized by dominant systems that routinely marginalize. For most of the world's population, you know, the current systems are not <laughs> something to be celebrated. Um, and they live with that destabilization already. So that was a rather long answer to you. <laughs> That's not a lot that I can add to that wonderful, <laughs> wonderful summary. Thank you so much, Blake. I, I would say that also my hope comes from conversations just like this. And there are so many more conversations like this. There are many grassroots efforts um, as um, Blake has said, but it has been taken a long time for some of these concepts to penetrate um, academia, but I think it's happening now. And the other dimension of this that also brings me great hope is there are so many young people, so many people who really see hope uh, and uh, take action for their future. Uh, and I think that is great cause for hope. The other thing, to add further is that the interconnectivity that we're seeing we, we technology is helping in in this sense we're also seeing a breaking down of so many silos and um, i think planetary health has been a wonderful um, uh, mechanism to do this to bring people up together from so many different spheres so many different perspectives all to try and bring something unique um, to uh, that rich picture. Uh, and that means that the more perspectives we have, the more voices we hear, the, 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 the better we will be able to disentangle some of these challenges. And I think that also you know, when, when we um, have become so siloed, we have made um, in the separation, we have added complexity that doesn't need to be there. We have been looking at individual little parts of the problem. Uh, and we all know as physicians, and Anna had a great question, which I'll get to later, but we all know um, that we don't treat each individual symptom out. But the, the better approach is to look at the disease, to look at the common um, elements, the, 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 we call it the common denominator, I guess, but it's really actually not the lowest, it's really the highest. Uh, value that we should be putting on again our spiritual ecology the value systems that perhaps are um, underlying all of these problems and causing all of the individual um, problems that we're looking at and I think that by having this much more integrated approach this much more connected conversation uh, that is a great a great cause for hope and the disruption that we are feeling at the moment, I totally agree with, with Blake, is that we need to crack the status quo in order to make the changes. Um, and that doesn't have to be a violent process, but I think that there will be um, push and pull. And we need to remember that this point in time, it may seem because we're in the middle of it, but when we look back, we'll see that it was a necessary part of our growth. Uh, and um, 
I, I, I'm sure other people have got other um, comments that they would like to make from, from the panel. Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. I think when you talked about this cracks, this combines really well with what you said like beforehand in your talk, that in these moments of challenge, we discover what we're really capable of. So we're probably, we're not courageous enough to really create this change in moments where we're like pretty fine and okay, because we're, we don't have this incentive to really change something. But in these moments of, yeah, discovering cracks or experiencing cracks, kind of and we yeah we discover what we actually could do i would hand over to hannah for the questions from the audience to let us know before we go into the discussion yeah so thanks also from the, uh, the side of our participants um maybe i'll start with a question to susan um so besides all the admiring um comments on your art and your talk <laughs> several participants also asked um how they can translate your ideas into their practice so this is especially mm. in health systems mm. and as healthcare professionals um or maybe in another way like how do you include your philosophy and in, in your mm. um your own practice mm. Well, I think the very first point to make is that we shouldn't underestimate our influence as individuals um, in every encounter that we have uh, and the flow and effects that that has beyond. And I also think we need to come back to um, my second point is that we, we need to attend to ourselves first. Uh, and that applies to everybody everywhere, not just in health. But we do know, particularly in healthcare, that physicians and other healthcare providers are not very healthy. We are often so stressed. We've completely um, disconnected <laughs> from um, our original purpose, why we're doing things. We've become so task-driven, time poor, that we very rarely just step back and take a big breath, <laughs> count to 10, <laughs> which I recommend you do uh, as many times a day as you can, particularly when things are, are getting busy and stressful, is just have a moment of mindfulness. And it's in those moments of re-energizing yourself and reconnecting to your own purpose that you can better help others. So I think it always, no matter what work we're doing, this applies uh, equally. And in that way that we can be much more tuned into what's going on in the therapeutic relationship as well as every other relationship that we have. And when we're much more aware of ourselves and others, we can see doors to perhaps uh, influence, to educate in ways that we might not if we're just checking boxes and going down a list. So I think that being mindful and aware uh, is perhaps the first and most important thing that we can do. And then you will see more opportunities, whether it's talking about nature contact to a family, whether it's about something else specific, um, but you will be much more attuned. So obviously every situation in your clinical practice is quite unique, but I think if you are in tune and you know why you're there and uh, you are able to remember that we are carers and so often that caring kindness it goes out the window <laughs> when we're running down the corridor trying to get from one um, patient to the next. So uh, I think that that is the greatest help to me personally. Uh, and, um, and I hope that helps answer Anna's question, which I think was, was uh, a very good <laughs> and very, very relevant. I don't know if there is anything others would like to add to that. No. If not, I'll maybe go on with the second question to both of you, because both of, both of you talked about the underlying um, value systems. And um, so how can we actually change them? And doesn't changing mindsets and value systems take a lot of time, which we don't really have? So this is maybe more directed into the, the wider perspective than the individual um, contact. Yeah. Again, I think that conversations like this, having conferences, having um, inviting people into a, an environment where we can discuss these things actually helps shift the, um, 
the, the narrative. It actually helps shift awareness. It helps normalize conversations about kindness. It helps normalize um, uh, the sorts of things that we're talking about here today, which, and I, and I spoke with um, Sabina at a, another conference last week, and we were saying that, that, you know, this sort of thing, you wouldn't really talk about this <laughs> uh, even five years ago, having these sorts of conversations about, about shifting um, to more positive um, mindsets and, and things like that. So I, I think having conversations, connecting widely, looking at how the work that we do as individuals connects to that bigger picture and understanding that it's all connected and that really in reinforcing that narrative whenever you have the opportunity that is how things change and, and I think um, the idea that we're running out of time is um, a fear-based um, scarcity thinking in itself as well so I think we must uh, recognize that we need to do things but not feel the fear that comes with it's too late or I'm running out of time because that often just perhaps stifles us um, I think we have to understand that we um, and again the technology is only part of this um, story but if we don't um, guide our technology and our solutions and with that sense of heart with that mutualism and I'm so glad to hear so many people talking about mutualism today but I think that if we keep reinforcing that that is how we can shift this and and tipping points as, as Blake said you can get to tipping points and then things change very quickly so we're, we're moving Yeah, maybe if I would add, just add on that, um, I could, I, in the spirit of um, normalizing, which I think is so important. I mean, I was, I was so delighted to discover in vivo a few years ago as a space where so, such diversity and uh, range of uh, perspectives and so on is, is welcomed um, beyond what we usually see in my field of public health. Um, and, you know, I was just so delighted that, um, Susan used what's really been a four letter word in academia for too long, uh, which is, you can probably guess what it is, but we don't talk about love much. And yet it's the foundation because, you know, you protect what you love. And, and when was the environmental movement really so squarely on uh, reconnecting to our love of each other and of the planet and of even ourselves, I mean, we're so steeped in self uh, hatred and lack of self esteem and all the rest. It's, it's it, these things are all connected as Susan pointed out. Um, so I think it's really key, but I think also, I think there's so much we can do in terms of solutioneering. And at the same time, at some level, if this is a relationship problem, any of you know who've had relationship problems that it, it that, that, they're not so amenable to technical fixes. And if you try and fix the other person or even yourself, it doesn't always go so well, right? It needs a change of heart. And what brings about a change of heart, right? It's, it's not the same kind of thing. And yes, sometimes that comes through awareness. I mean, we're seeing, um, I don't know how many of you are privy to this information, but we've had several now, I think three or four mass graves of children who went to resident, forced residential schools, indigenous children um, discovered in Canada just recently. And it sparked a nationwide conversation about this ugly part of our past um, that's really needed to happen. And I'm really feeling in the air like a shift, a change of heart about a willingness to acknowledge um, how Indigenous peoples have been treated in Canada and uh, a readiness for reconciliation at a deeper and more meaningful level. Um, so I think they can go hand in hand, but there's something that also that feels a little qualitatively different to me about change of heart than just um, getting um, more technical, um, fancier and more complicated in our uh, technical solutions. And mm. I think it's the full spectrum, yeah. And, and in the spirit of, of sharing, I um, meant to actually, um, sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen to um, invite uh, everybody who's, who would like to come to um, In Vivo. I'm not sure if you can see my slide, but um, 
we really uh, welcome um, uh, it, it input from everybody everywhere. Um, so please, uh, if you would like to participate, please send us an abstract. Thank you for the, for the advert <laughs> there, Blake. But, you know, like, like you, um, we really want to connect with um, different groups around the planet doing this same kind of work. And I think to answer the question a little further, you know, it's actually about connecting the networks of change as well. And in that way, we can really start to shift this narrative in a much quicker way. So um, we have both virtual and in-person um, uh, uh, sessions later in the year. So I'll, I'll take that down now, but I just wanted to invite everybody. Thank you very much, Susan. Maybe one more question from Hannah from the audience and then we'll get into the discussion because Sabina and Martin already joined as well. So, and you yeah. brought up many points already. Yeah, Hannah. So this is a question to you, Blake. Um, you mentioned the need to decolonize spaces and structures. Um, and do you have practical tips for movements um, on how to do this and or where to begin? Yeah, thank you. That's a really important question. And I don't have a fully fleshed recipe for that. I think we need to each come to it in our own ways. I think part of it is educating ourselves about the history of indigenous peoples and our also connecting to our own indigeneity. We're all indigenous to somewhere, right? And we've lost those roots in many cases. Um, I, th I think it's also about um, coming into a deeper understanding of what genuine allyship with indigenous peoples means. Um, and there's some great uh, resources for that, that. There's a Montreal protocol on allyship um, that is particularly well thought through in my opinion. Um, and that I think helps counter part of what we've seen recently is what some people have called performative allyship, you know, where we kind of wear it on our sleeve, but we don't follow through with all of the other actions. We, we do the visible stuff, you know, the posting on social media, et cetera. But I think another part is really um, just connecting with and becoming aware of the extent to which we ourselves are colonized inside that our life worlds as Alfred Schutz that famous sociologist put it you know where where our life worlds are colonized by many of the systems of education and modalities of thought and ways of understanding the world that run deep and are intergenerational and that we're being invited to um, come into more direct awareness of and choose like an act of choice of choosing which things do we want to continue to consciously believe in and which ones are we ready to adopt something different. And I think part of the inspiration for me is to see that a lot of this work has been done in many ways already. That's why I point to all these other knowledge traditions. Like for me, it's a bit in the spirit of you can lead a horse to water but not make it drink you know part of what i want to do is just like show that other ways of knowing are possible and that are self referential like they're they're complete systems in themselves and that because uh, i think part of the issue is that when we're so steeped in a particular ways of knowing like western science etc we take them for granted as if it's uh you know, I guess Maggie Thatcher's famous term, Tina, <laughs> there is no alternative. So just knowing that there is an alternative and knowing that there are other ways then invites us into learning more about them and then consciously choosing what we want to believe going forward. Because I think one of the beautiful allies in this change work is that once you know something, you can't unknow it. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we used to, I, I always marvel at how much we, we try and educate people, whether it's about the, the, the physical dangers of smoking or climate change, but, you know, any idiot can spend two minutes on the internet and learn all they need to know about those things. So it's like we have a willful ignorance also, right, where we arrange not to know what we know that if we knew we would need to change, like there's a cognitive dissonance there, right? So many of us do this on many fronts, whether it's about our history, uh, past relations with indigenous people or other things, we kind of turn a, a blind eye. And I think that's why Joanna Macy's work is really so inspiring to me because it's about acknowledging 
um, the current state of affairs, like a clear-eyed realism and, and seeing with new eyes. But for her, ground zero is acknowledging our grief for the destruction that's all around us. And I think that's a big part of why we turn a blind eye to so many things. It's like we're overwhelmed. And when we just really allow ourselves to connect with the reality, I know it hits me every time I hear a chainsaw and another beautiful being that we call trees comes down because it's seen as inconvenient or you know, it might in the next 10 years fall on somebody's car. And I see what priorities we put you know, as if, you know, because our child might get a, an illness uh, a few years from now, we're just going to kill them now so we don't have to have the inconvenience later. If we really treated trees the way we treat our children, we'd have a very different world. I'm sorry, that's a bit of a rambling answer, but... <laughs> Maybe I can link into this because I think this this thought about the relationship is quite an important one. Um, we had a conversation, Martin and me and with Karin Hutflitz recently, and she pointed out that this narrative of we are we should protect nature because we're dependent on it. It's it's of course also true, but would you speak like that inside your family? You wouldn't, right? You you may be dependent, or a child may be dependent on on something, but you wouldn't emphasize that. You'd rather emphasize the connectedness, and that's why you are taking care of each other, not because of dependence. So I thought that was quite an interesting thought. And um, yeah, and I, I I can't resist bringing up Thich Nhat Hans' way phrase that speaks to me so much. He talks about interbeing. And to me, that's like almost the next level after interdependence. Like we talk about dependence and independence and then moving towards an appreciation of interdependence. But this notion of interbeing is just speaks so powerfully, you know, and, and some of the, the, the like the, the, the simplest like recognition and tea ceremonies of kind of recognizing the sunshine and the rain mm. and everything that is in your tea. <laughs> is like an acknowledgement of interbeing. And there's a great sense of freedom in those moments, I think, just letting everything go and really thinking about what are the really important things in life? Why are we here? And I'll mention that four letter word, <laughs> love is something that's so important. So we should protect nature because we love it um, as well as depend on it. <laughs> Martin, you're muted. I have one question to both of you, which is related to an experience I've had in many transformation projects. So that on one level, we have the technical dimension of the technical scientific questions, and then we have the relationship dimension. And I'm fully with you that normally the relationship dimension is not addressed. But at the same time, it is important to kind of dive into the intricate and unique uh, uh, kind of intricacies of both dimensions playing into each other, because it would also be a real mistake to only look at the relationship side when it is a technical problem. So there's a struggle of finding out what is the aspect that is more technically and what is relationship, because you can easy get, easily get lost and we love all of each other and so on and so forth and so not, not do the, the right technical fix that is available for saving a child or whatever is needed. So uh, I really think that at, at the heart of it is, is, a, is a constant uh, inquiry into what are the technical and the relationship aspects and what is what needed. And sometimes, you know, someone who is good in taking care is needed. Sometimes a real hardwired technical expert, we need to resolve something and move forward. And also for what we have in front of us, I see many of the things we have in front of us, we need technical fixes and technical innovation but the real question is how are we able to innovate in social and technical uh, aspects at the same time and kind of be connected to each other, but also struggle with each other and when to work on which side? Well, I would just say that it shouldn't be seen as a struggle. It shouldn't be seen as separate, that these should very much be integral. And if we start to approach it in that way, then there, there won't be this and or, oh, sorry, either or, that of course we need to have the 
information, the technology, but that shouldn't be seen as, as, as separate from who we are or separate from humanity. Um, it, it's really, humanity is, is all of it. Um, and I think we need to just, I guess we're trying to rebalance a conversation that's been only about um, the nuts and bolts of science. And, and this part of the, the conversation really has been greatly neglected for so long. So I guess we're just trying to recalibrate, but actually recognize these things are not separate. And that networks like in vivo, like I'm sure um, the Academy is that you're bringing people together who have all of that technology, who have all of that expertise, but you need to kind of glue it together with a sense of um, a shared purpose um, otherwise you know it, it will disintegrate and we won't actually make the steps forward that we need we do need a compass otherwise you know we'll be all going off in different directions and it will probably fall the deep <laughs> but actually here I disagree because I agree with you we, we you know it is not it is not separate but it is distinct and we need to know what, when are we in which area of phenomenon. And for me, it is a struggle. It's an ongoing struggle. It's not a bad struggle. I welcome the struggle because it also is part of aliveness, but it's not an easy kind of making a choice or, or so. It's, it's a real going also deeper with understanding the technical dimension and the relation and then the intricateness uh, of both. But can't you do both at the same time? I, I don't honestly see why you have to dissect. No, I'm not, not saying, I, I, I'm not saying dissect. I think to distinguish, hmm. to be clear when are you in which phenomenon. And, and for would me, I, I would only ask why, why? Why do you need to separate this? Why well, does it have I'm, to be? I'm saying you don't have to separate, you have to distinguish, which is a difference. And but I'm just asking why? <laughs> because it's different areas of phenomenons with different rules where different interventions uh, apply. Uh, that's why. But I would I, say like maybe that's, a, that's this urge for humans to understand things. And yeah. I would actually agree with Susan. And I think like, why do we need to understand which belongs to which area or what belongs to which area? Why can't we just um, trust in our intuition and just kind of act into the openness? To I, I think there's actually two interrelated issues here. One is, um, I think something that in environmentalism we fall prey to all too often, which is thinking that we need one unified strategy. And we, we, we fail to acknowledge that people are equipped in different ways. And in the spirit of the phrase, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, some people are drawn more to the heart work and some are drawn more to the technical work and we need all of it. And it doesn't all have to be neatly reconciled. Um, and at the same time, I think technology without heart is just like nuclear weaponry. <laughs> And, uh, you know, heart without technology also runs the risk of being ineffective. So, uh, but I think what we need is, is for um, what we've, you know, we have a lopsided Western development, which is all about technological prowess and dominance. And I think um, what I take from many of my indigenous friends and colleagues is this notion of grounding everything you do in a, in a, relational worldview of sacred living in sacred reciprocity and if that is ground zero then we can do all the technical work in the world and em empower the most brilliant scientists to come up with things while keeping an eye on that alignment and mm -hmm. to me that's how we we bridge this this gap is we recognize that we don't have to have a one size fits all solution for everyone because we're all different. We all have different gifts, like the sweet spot in my last slide, we all have different gifts to offer. And at the same time, as a society, we need to recognize that there has to be some foundational values and principles that drive and align our work. And then we can unleash the full creativity and, and uh, diversity of perspectives and contributions uh, mm -hmm. from the full spectrum, from the scientific to the more heart-based, um, because there's so many modalities in that yeah. continuum. And scientific discovery and technology comes often from moments of inspiration. So again, uh, 
Um, I, I think that everybody will have their own strengths and that's part of the diversity of richness that, that I was talking about, that it's really about respecting um, each, you know, if we want to make it into sides of a discussion, I, I honestly don't think it needs to be, but just recognising that we need all of it. Um, and I think that it's a matter of understanding that, it, you know, there is, when we talk, particularly when we talk about planetary health, the whole concept is that everything is connected, everything is interdependent. And it's not just the physical systems, it's, it's the, the humanity, it's the, it's, you know, the, 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 the multi-layered aspects of all of this that are all interdependent. Thank you very much for your lively discussion. We would have one more question, but Ed, Ed, as we are already like punctually on time, <laughs> I would pose the question to Susan and Blake, if you would be open for one more question. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would um, add one question because we talked a lot about deep listening and I totally agree that this is needed and something that will drive us forward but you also and I think that was really strong of both of your pre presentations talked about those who don't want to listen about those who are polluting who have interests behind that and I want just wanted to ask and also those are the people who are not in these spaces right who are not discussing right now here so so how do we deal with this do we have to not listen at some point um what would be your point on that well, when it comes to rampant dis destruction and concentration of wealth, I think um, there have to be some firm limits at some point too. I'm reminded of um, uh, a famous organizer, Saul Alinsky in the US in the 1960s and 70s, who said there's two kinds of power in the world, people power and money power. And money power will prevail until people power organizes. <laughs> And so I think part of what we're both speaking to here is like a groundswell of awareness and appreciation and reorientation. Um, and, and there are those, you know, it illustrated it beautifully in Susan's slide of the hand maneuvering the puppets of polarization. You know, those hands also need to be slapped <laughs> and those strings need to be cut. And, um, and they may not, we may decide collectively that we don't want to wait for all of the listening that might need to happen from, from those spaces. Um, and I think we can, we, we do know the power of collective action when we're ready for it. But it's a great question. It, it is a great question and I echo everything Blake said. And we need to remember that we can't change people's minds. That's their choice but we can promote awareness and we can, again, expand those people who may not be aware and may not um, have yet decided what they want to do. But I, again, there will be some people who are absolutely close-minded and there's almost nothing you can do apart from promote awareness and a choice is what we all have we, and freedom and choice are, uh, are really up the, of the utmost. So. I think that we just really need to make our own choices and promote awareness in those around us and beyond as much as we can. One of the things that really stood out for me from Paulo Freire's work um, is when he said that um, the, the oppressor's liberation is bound up in the liberation of the oppressed. And that really struck me. And often, he said, often the oppressors don't realize that because they're so bound up in systems of oppression where they think that their well being depends mm -hmm. on the oppression of others. But I would like to believe that there's some truth in what he suggested. And at the same time, you know, we sometimes we just need to use laws and say, okay, no more plastics, no more, yeah. <laughs> no yeah. more, um, you know, multi billionaires, no more. Um, you know, obscene concentration of wealth, uh, carbon caps, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're, they're, we have policy levers when there's sufficient collective will to constrain the unbridled greed, et cetera, of others who have lost their way in these systems that we've allowed them to colonize. 
that comes back to the shifting of Thank value you. systems because we've valued those things. When we no longer value those things, when they become unacceptable and abhorrent, then things will shift as well. And we're seeing so much of that already. Like uh, I saw, uh, I don't, maybe uh, most of your listeners are not so familiar with this, but in North America, one of the symbols of excess in the personal transportation is the Hummer, <laughs> right? Which was an off cast of, you know, the US military at some point. And I saw one on the road recently and it just reminded me that those were symbols of conspicuous consumption and thumbing your nose at climate change. Um, and we hardly see any now, and it would be seen as an embarrassment. It's like the Tesla has taken over now. And I know yeah. there's, that's a really problematic comparison because it's still about consumption. It still has huge ecological impact, but we do see the, those sea changes already all around us. Thank you very much to the two of you. I have two things that I would like to shortly to summarize or to give to the audience back as a short reminder, two quotes. So one from you, Blake, you said, we were born to dream. I think that was a really nice one. And also from Susan, from you, that we should not underestimate our the, in, the influence as in, individuals. And also with this comes, I think, as we, we repeatedly say, but I think it, it, it can't be bad to repeat it again, but everybody can think, who does he or she know in their environment that has some kind of position with influence that we could talk to to also kind of in, yeah kind of give the, give the um, incentive to rethink their opinion thank you very much Blake and Susan for joining us Thanks from me as well um, for these inputs that were both inspiring, but also challenged us to be critical about our narratives and our worldviews. I love that this had both in it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.